Hey guys, welcome to our video for hypothesis testing. So, it's our final lecture for the year. This is our last section, and this is the culmination of everything we've done. So, hypothesis testing is a really kind of complicated and yet simple process. The reason it's complicated is especially the technical back, kind of behind the scenes things are very kind of complicated in what's happening. Yet it's very simple because we're gonna use our calculator to help us do a lot of the heavy lifting cal calculator wise or calculation wise. And so we're gonna go through, start this in three parts. The first is just gonna be some basics, kind of what it, what's about, what's the steps, what do they do? Then we're gonna go into testing a claim about a proportion and then testing a claim about a mean. So let's get started. So basic things about hy hypothesis testing. You can do hypothesis tests for proportions, means, standard deviations, variances, lots of different things. We're gonna focus on proportions and means because those are what we like. So first of all, what is a hypothesis? Well, in statistics, a hypothesis is simply a claim or a statement about a property of a population. So as you know, those are called parameters, right? So a hypothesis test, sometimes also referred to as a test of significance, is a procedure for testing a claim about a property of a population. Now, that word significance, the very first lecture we had in this class, we mentioned something about like practical versus statistical significance. Things can be statistically significant or have a significant statistical kind of difference, yet not really be practically different. We talked about those with an example of, uh, I believe an Atkins weight loss group, where over the course of 12 months, the average weight loss was four pounds, and that was found to be statistically significant. However, if you lose four pounds over a year, while you're on a diet, that's not a significant result. And so we wanna make sure that we're remembering this word significance here is referring to statistically significant, not practically significant. So let's use this example to help guide us through. And this is actually gonna be one of our first examples that we're gonna do a hypothesis test on. Do the majority of shoppers feel uncomfortable with drones delivering their purchases? Okay, so a study was done. They asked 1,009 consumers, are you comfortable with having drones deliver your purchase? And 54% or 545 of them responded with no. So we're gonna use a little p to denote the proportion of consumers not comfortable with your own deliveries. The majority claim is equivalent to the claim that the proportion is greater than half, right? So a majority just simply means more than half. So our claim here is that P is greater than 0.5. That symbolic expression is now our kind of claim. We'll talk about how we kind of state those and what we do with those in a minute. So the big picture with this, what we're looking for is, is this result significantly high? The result we got in that study, okay? 506 is 50.1%. While that is more than half, it's barely so. And so it's not significantly high or statistically significant result. 106 out of 100, or sorry, 1,006 out of 1,009 would definitely be very clearly significantly high. But in this example, we have 545 or 54%. Is that enough to say that's statistically significant? Is that significantly high enough to say that a majority of consumers are not comfortable with drone deliveries? So we're gonna use technology, as I said, our calculators are gonna do all of this heavy lifting. We're gonna bounce back and forth between the slideshow and my calculator emulator so I can show you guys how we use those when that gets to it. So for a, chapter, for a test of significance, what we're really testing is to see basically at some significance level, is this result significantly high or significantly low? Now when we did probabilities, we talked about is the probability of this significantly high or significantly low, so the probability of something being significantly high, or unusually high, I believe was the term we used, we would look at the probability of getting that thing or higher. The same thing for low, but that thing or lower. And so that kind of idea is what we're gonna use here on a kind of a bigger scale, some different tools that we've learned. So the first step in doing a hypothesis test, or the first kind of written thing down that you're gonna need to do is identify the hypotheses. There's at least two. The first is always the null hypothesis, which is always denoted by this capital H sub zero, okay? This is kind of the accepted, currently based thing 
the kind of initial state, whatever it is, depending on your problem, okay? And it is always an equal to statement, okay? It is always H sub zero is our null hypothesis, is the proportion is equal to something, or the mean is equal to something, okay? You can occasionally kind of tweak it to say that it's you know less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, but for this class, we're always gonna say equals. So this, as I, was, as I just said, right, this is usually the currently accepted value. So if it's something like, say, body temperature, right, that's currently accepted to be 98.6 degrees. If it's something like, um, <laughs> sorry, if it's something like the amount of, say, some chemical in rivers, and some major organizations said, oh, in natural, in fresh water, there's usually this much of that chemical, then that would be the accepted value, okay? That would be a null hypothesis. And we would have to then use this test to see if our sample disproves that or not. And that brings us to our alternative hypothesis. These are typically denoted by H1, HA, lowercase or HA uppercase. You can have multiple alternative hypotheses in more complicated, complex situations, in which case you'd have an H1, H2, H3. But we're only gonna deal with kind of a null and alternate in a very simple state. And in this class, as you see at the very end of the statement, that is either a less than, a greater than, or a not equal to statement, okay? And so this is just what we think the difference is from the null hypothesis, okay? This is pretty much always the actual claim that is being tested. So back to our, our example, um, so this is, sorry, this is a different example. So back to our example of our consumers and the drone problem, our null hypothesis would be that P equals 0.5, that it's kind of either or, doesn't matter. And our alternate hypothesis, the one that we're claiming, is that P is greater than 0.5. Okay, so those would create our two hypotheses. So let's look at a null and alternate hypothesis for this here. So looking at this, we see that in 107 adults, they had a mean body temperature of 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit. So our null and alternate hypothesis. Well, the null hypothesis is very simple. Currently accepted state is 98.6 degrees. So our null hypothesis, this is the way we would write this out. So H sub zero colon. So this is saying that the null hypothesis is, and we're saying that the mean is equal to 98.6. Now, this problem doesn't specify kind of what the claim really is. So it's kind of a little more ambiguous here for our alternative hypothesis. Clearly, the mean of the sample is lower than our accepted state. So we wouldn't use something like the mean is greater than 98.6. That wouldn't make any sense based on our sample. So here, our alternative hypothesis could either be that the mean is less than 98.6 or simply that the mean is not equal to 98.6. Okay. And we're going to go through multiple examples finding the null and alternate hypothesis. So here are kind of the broad stroke steps, and we're gonna kind of shrink some of these down, and some of these we'll kind of talk about doing in our heads or kind of having as more scratch notes. And I'll identify the ones that are kind of, you must write these down to get points on problems. So, step one is to identify the claim. So what is it that we are testing? What are we concerned with? What are we talking about? Okay, and express that in a symbolic form. Our next thing is to give the symbolic form um, of basically the opposite. So if our claim is that the majority of people are uncomfortable with drone deliveries, so then our claim would be that P is greater than 0.5. Our opposite of that would simply be that P is less than or equal to 0.5. Okay. Now we're gonna. The reason we do that is because we can use those to help us identify our null and alternative hypothesis. Very simply, we can look at those two things. Whichever one has an equals in it is going to be our null hypothesis. Whichever one doesn't is going to be our alternative hypothesis. Okay. Remember, our null hypothesis is always h sub zero equals. Okay. 
Well, it's not h sub zero equals. It's h sub zero, and then mu or p in this in this case is equal. Step four is select a level of significance. This is something that throughout this throughout this class will be given to you in the problem. I'll say conduct a significance test at a level of significance of 0 0.05, or or say do a hypothesis test with significance level 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, whatever they are. Those are the same alphas, the same kind of level of significance that we talked about last lesson with estimates and finding those critical values. Okay. Step five, identify the test statistic. There's a couple different things we can do from there, p-value method or the critical value method. We are going to use exclusively the p-value method. And the reason why is because our calculator does it for us. Okay, It does all of the work here for us with the exception of seven. But it sets us up very easily to do seven. Okay, So steps five and six are all going to be on the calculator. So we combine these into one kind of calculator test. Step seven. Okay. We are going to reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, our level of significance. And if it's greater than alpha, we fail to reject. Notice neither of these two statements say anything about accepting. Okay, We are either going to reject the null or fail to reject the null. And it, if you think of it like this, why do you guys know that 98.6 is the temperature, average temperature of the body? Because we've always been told that, right? So that's kind of our given accepted state. If I conduct a sample, that is not going to prove to me that the temperature of a body is really 98.6 or is not, or is, but it could show me that it's not. Okay. And so if it, if there's enough evidence in our sample to suggest that it's not true, we would say that we reject. However, if there's not enough evidence, we just say, okay, I'm not going to reject it yet. I'm not accepting it. I'm not saying that it is true. I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's not true. Okay, kind of counter and kind of weird and kind of wishy-washy. But in mathematics, to prove something is an absolute always. So it's very hard to prove a statistical, a statistical value like that. And our final step is simply to restate our decision from step seven in non-technical kind of common language terms. Okay. I never want to see any terms of uh, fail to reject reject, null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, anything like that, okay? We'll go through how to word these when we go through our examples, but very simply, it's kind of um, really just basic English, right? There is or is not enough evidence to say that our claim is true. That's pretty much how it kind of goes most of the time, okay? So let's look at this, okay? So we want to use the original claim to create a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. So we need to identify the claim, give it symbolic form, identify kind of the opposite of the claim and give it symbolic form, and then from that create our null and alternative hypothesis. Okay. So back to our drone delivery. All right. So our claim was that the majority of consumers are uncomfortable with drone delivery. So step one is really simple. We kind of covered it already. The majority is simply anything over 0.5. And so that means that we are claiming that P is greater than 0.5. The opposite of that is that P must be less than or equal to 0.5. Okay, pretty simple so far. So now let's identify our null and alternative hypothesis. So for the null hypothesis, okay, remember, we always have to have an equals. Of the two statements, we have our claim P is greater than 0.5 or P is less than or equal to 0.5. Okay. Less than or equal to is one that contains equals. So very simply, our null hypothesis becomes h sub zero. The null hypothesis is that p is equal to 0.5. Okay. This is not from the sample. This 0.5 is not from the sample. This 0.5 is from our claim that a majority of people are uncomfortable with drone deliveries. So the majority means it has to be greater than 0.5. So 0.5 becomes this value. Now. Our alternative hypothesis is the one that we are testing. This is what we are looking to try and show or not show, depending on what your mental image is or, or what, your, what your positioning is. And so here, that's very simply that uh, our H1, our alternative hypothesis, is that P is greater than 0.5. Okay. 
Step four, level of significance, alpha. Now, as I said, this is the same thing from Z sub alpha over two, right? It's that same kind of alpha thing. And again, it is just giving, it's given to you in the problem. Now, that alpha, what it represents, what it actually is, is really cool. That alpha is very simply the probability that we reject a true null hypothesis. So if we think back to our body temperature problem, if alpha is 0 0.05, what that's saying is there's a probability of 0 0.05 that I reject that the average body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit when it is actually 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So that's what that alpha stands for. And we'll talk about those uh, that idea, that concept a little bit later. So 0 0.5, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, those are, the those are common choices. 0 0.05 is the most common. Um, again, we can use anything. I could even say what's the 0 0.234 level of significance. It wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense unless it's for a very specific purpose. But that's kind of what we deal with here. Now, again, with the critical region and the um, idea of confidence intervals, we talked about the larger the kind of confidence level you are, the bigger the space. Same thing here. The more confident you are that you are not going to reject a true null hypothesis, kind of the less likely you are to reject it. And that's based on these alpha levels. Okay, so the smaller an alpha level is, the less likely you are to reject a null hypothesis. Okay. Step five talks about kind of how we find these test statistics. I'm not really worried about. We really aren't going to use the test statistic at all because, again, our calculator is going to do everything for us. But here, this is very important. Look at this table. These first three rows of this table. I couldn't get rid of that bottom row, so we're just going to leave it on there. And you can ignore it. Know these first three. It's very important. Okay, if we are testing a claim about a proportion, okay, we are going to be using a z distribution, and the requirements to be able to do so is simply that n times p is greater than or equal to point, greater than or equal to five, and n times q is greater than or equal to five. Okay, now this p is very special. This p is very special here. It is not just the arbitrary p or p hat from your sample. This is very specifically the P from your null hypothesis, okay? Which means this Q is just one minus that P. And we'll see that again in an example later. Here's the test. Again, we're not finding these, so don't really stress about these. We mainly want these first three rows, first three columns. So the next two rows both correspond to testing a claim about a population mean. Now, the difference between the two rows is simply whether or not we know what sigma is. So if sigma is not known, we will be using a t-distribution. If sigma is known, we'll be using the normal z-distribution. That's the exact same as what we had when we did confidence intervals. So our requirements for this is that either sigma is not known or it is known, and we are dealing with a normally distributed population, or n is greater than 30. Okay. So notice these, uh, what they have is sigma is known and normal distribution, normally distributed population, or sigma is known and is greater than 30. So it just restates the sigma known part and the sigma not known part. However, I'm just going to say flat out for this whole column, if sigma is not known, we're using T. If sigma is known, we're using Z. Our restrictions or requirements are population normal or N greater than 30. Okay? So that's that. This will tell you which test that we need to do, which operation in your calculator you need to use. Okay, So make sure you guys are kind of aware of this and maybe even have that in your notes, something that can be easy to flash to when you are working on the test. So back to our drone delivery. So the claim that P is greater than 0.5 is about the proportion. So that means we are going to use the normal distribution and these are our requirements. Okay, so for the requirements to be satisfied means that 1,000, hmm, sorry, 1,009 times our P, which is 0.5, this is again that kind of from the null hypothesis, not from our sample, and Q, 0.5, are going on to satisfy these two equations, okay?
Here, it's very clearly both true because 0.5 is just half. Half of 1009 is definitely greater than equal to 5. Step six, find the critical value of the test statistic and the p-value or critical values. We are just going to be focusing on the p-value because, again, our calculator gives it to us, and that just gives us a straight jump into step seven. So test statistic, you can feel free to read that. We're going to skip it. Here's our drone delivery stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff here. Again, feel free to read it. Be thankful that we have lovely calculators that do a lot of this work for us. Okay. Critical region. Don't need to worry about it because we're not doing it. Okay. I do want to talk about this. Okay. So well, let me go back. Critical region is the area corresponding to all of the values of the test statistic that would make us reject the null hypothesis. If we look over here, depending on what our alternative hypothesis is, we will either get a two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed test. If our alternative hypothesis is simply that something is not equal to, we get a two-tailed test. Basically, we're saying, okay, it could be above or it could be below. If something is a less than alternative hypothesis, that is always going to be the left tail because that's lower. And if it's greater than, then the right tail test because that's the greater area. So those are three tests we use based on that. Now, the reason why those are important to know is because that tells us where our critical regions are. Those critical regions are bound by alpha. So this is our good old Z sub alpha. These are Z alpha over two, because that alpha area is split over two. Okay, but again, we're not using these because our calculator is so helpful. So let's talk about that. The p-value method, the easiest way. So in a hypothesis test, the p-value is simply the probability of getting a value of the test statistic. So in other words, what you got from your sample that is at least as extreme. Now that sounds very strange. And what it is is simply just a way of wording it so that you don't have to say that is at least that value or greater or at most that value or less, which are two kind of ideas for something to be unusually high versus unusually low. So make sure you guys are kind of aware of what's happening here. If the p-value is small, that means basically, very simply, the chances of whatever test or whatever sample you got happening just by random chance, given that everything else is true, is very little. So let's say, for instance, you have a temperature, you are taking everyone's temperature. If the probability of getting a mean of, say, 97 is very low, then we would say that most likely one of our assumptions isn't correct. This is something we talked about a little bit back in Chapter 4 and probabilities, but we're really diving into it now. So, we go back to our drone delivery. We can actually find that it has a test statistic of z equals 2.55. And here's the cool part. Its p-value is 0 0.0054. That is our p-value. That, again, will be given to us directly from our calculator. So, what do we do with it? Okay, finding p-values, again, we're using our calculator so we don't have to do this. This is something you had to go through all of these steps back when we used tables and did things by hand a lot more. But we have lovely calculators, so don't worry about it. Now here's a really big thing, this is really important, and this is something that can really cause some issues um, when it comes time for like tests and things like that. There's a very big difference between a p-value and the population proportion p and a sample proportion p hat it is very important that you use the correct symbols to represent the correct thing for p value we never just say p equals blank we always say p value equals blank because we don't want to accidentally mistake that p value for the population proportion so make sure you guys are very careful with that critical values we're on board all right, here we go. Step seven, making our decisions. So remember, as I said earlier, our p-value for this problem was 0 0.0054. So what we need to do is compare this to alpha. If the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. If it's greater than alpha, we fail to reject. 
as a stupid little saying in here, if the P is low, the null must go. I find that terrible. And But if you like it, if it makes sense to you, great, keep it. So for our problem, okay, our P value, 0 0.0054, is definitely less than or equal to our alpha, which was 0 0.05. Therefore, we would reject the null hypothesis for this problem. So again, using re, step eight is restating the decision using non-technical terms, okay? We don't wanna try and sound better than other people or anything like that, so we wanna keep it very simple, okay? So for the drone delivery, is there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the majority of consumers are uncomfortable with drone deliveries. Since we rejected the null hypothesis because 0 0.0054 is less than or equal to 0 0.05, this would be our final statement, okay? So the pieces you need to have whenever you're doing a problem like this, you need to have the null and alternative hypotheses. You need to show me what you typed into your calculator, what you got back out of your calculator. You need to show me the p-value, and you need to show me the uh, final statement in your decision, okay? Now, you may say, like, well, my... Final statement is my decision, but no, it doesn't work that way. And the reason why is very simply because I don't know if maybe you made a mistake in your final conclusion. I want to know what your decision was and what your conclusion was. That way it can be very clear on whether you knew what you were doing or not. So here's something about how to word it. Feel free to read through these. Um, I really just think that this is the very easiest way to do it. Your two kind of things that you're going to say are either there is or there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that the majority of consumers are uncomfortable with their own deliveries. So if we fail to reject, we just simply say there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that the majority of customers consumers are uncomfortable with their own deliveries. That's it. There is, there is not. If you do that, it makes everything really, really simple for you. Okay. So let's keep going. Go, accept or fail. Never accept. I think I've said that before. Don't use accept, it's misleading. So here we want to talk about the two types of errors. We already kind of mentioned one and kind of mentioned alpha, but I want to be a little kind of specific with it. So when we say there's two types of errors, we very clearly label them type of a type one error and a type two error, okay? A type one error is accidentally rejecting a correct null hypothesis or a true null hypothesis. A type two error is failing to reject a false null hypothesis. So this would be examples, so examples of this would be like saying, so back here with our drones, right? We rejected the null hypothesis. So if that null hypothesis is actually true, that it's not a majority of people are uncomfortable with drone deliveries, then we would have con then we would have committed a type one error. Okay. However, if say people really it's the majority of people really are uncomfortable with that, and we said we failed to reject, that would be a type two error. Okay, and the probability of that happening is beta. Don't worry about where beta came from or how to find it. I'm not going to ask you to. That's something for a future class in statistics. So, here's a little table for you. Now, let's get into some actual problems, okay? Because I went through a whole bunch of information, a lot of downloading, a lot of uploading to your brain. So if you need to, pause the video, take a break, go get something to drink, walk around, and we will jump back in with part two. So, the key concept here is to complete a procedure for testing a claim about a population proportion. And we're going to do that using hypothesis testing, using the p-value method, okay, because that is the easiest one with our calculator. So let's conduct a formal hypothesis test about a proportion. Some symbols we need to know are n is our sample size with the number of trials we did, okay. p is the population proportion. This is our given value from the kind of currently accepted state of things, our null hypothesis. p hat is our sample proportion, which again we find just by x divided by n. 
and q is 1 minus b. And if you want, q hat is 1 minus b hat. So our conditions that have to be met here is that n times p is greater than or equal to 5, and n times q is greater than or equal to 5. Both of these have to be true for this to work. If only one of them is true, it doesn't work. And remember, this p is not from our sample. It's not p hat. So it's not, oh yeah, there were five successes and five failures in our sample. It is that n times p, the p from our null hypothesis, must give us more than five, and n times q, using our null hypothesis again, must be greater than five. So, back to our good old drone deliveries. Okay, here's our values. We've gotten a lot of this already done for us. Okay, um, a requirement check, 0.5 times 1009 is 504.5, which is very obviously greater than five. So, check. Step one, we already talked about, right? P is greater than five. Step two, P is less than or equal to five. We did our null and alternate hypothesis already in, in the first part of this video. So we have those here. Step four, for the significance level, we select alpha equals 0 0.05, which is a really common choice. <clears throat> now, step five and six, how do I do this on my calculator? As you can see right here, it's broken down very simply. Stat, then test, and one prop Z test, and this is what your screen would look like, this would give you, and this is the information you would put in for this test. So let's grab our calculator and do this together. So, as it said, we are gonna go to stat, and then we need to go over to test, and we want the one prop Z test. Okay, two prop Z tests if you have two different proportions that you're kind of comparing and looking at their differences, but we want the one prop Z test. You hit enter. It doesn't matter if you have an old calculator, new calculator, whatever, this is what you get. Okay, this is the screen that you get. Now, what's really nice about this is that it's very simple, okay, but the problem can be that to keep it simple, they used some kind of cheating symbols. This right here, P0, this is asking what is the null hypothesis. We are saying the null hypothesis is that the proportion is 0.5, okay? And then we go down X, it's the number of successes we had or the number of uh, things that we got. So in this case, it's 545 out of N, which is 1009, okay? Now this next line is where we choose what our alternate hypothesis is. This first thing is saying the proportion, and we are given three options. So our claim is that the proportion, the true proportion is not equal to our null hypothesis, so this value. Our true proportion is less than our null hypothesis, or our true proportion is greater than. Well, in our problem, we are saying very simply that the Null hypothesis p is equal to 0 0.5, and our alternate is that p is greater than 0 0.5. So we want to choose this third option here. So to do that, we get down to that row, press over until we highlight that option, and then we hit enter. Okay. All that's left to do is hit calculate. You always calculate, don't draw. So calculate. We get this lovely screen here. Okay. So what do we do from this point on? Well, it's really simple. We read this screen off for what we need. So it did a one prop Z test where our claim was that the proportion is greater than 0.5. It gave us this Z value, which is our test statistic. Our test statistic is 2.54999.5628. Now this P is not the population proportion. That can be very confusing and this is kind of a, a frustrating downside of these calculators. But because it would take so much room to say p-value, and you wouldn't have as much room for the numbers, they just call the p-value p. So this is our p-value for the problem, and our p-value for this problem is 0 0.00538.6238. Our p-hat is our sample mean from the problem, which was 0.5401, right, or 54%. And there's our n. 
So what do you really need from the screen? You need this number here. This P equals 0 0.0054. Okay. So this is our resulting screen. This tells me that my p-value is 0 0.0054, which is definitely less than or equal to our alpha, which was 0 0.05. Therefore, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. P-value is low, the null must go. Sounds terrible, sounds tacky, but it works. So, because we rejected the null hypothesis, we can conclude there is sufficient sample evidence to support the claim that more than half of consumers are uncomfortable with drone deliveries. That's it, that's our problem. So what you're gonna need to write down, what you're gonna need to include on the test is you'll need to include what your null hypothesis is, what your alternative hypothesis is, which test you used, what p-value you got, whether you're rejecting or fail to rejecting, and what your final statement is, okay? That's it. That's what you got to do, okay? So it's pretty simple, pretty easy. Let's do another one, okay? Now, that last problem, we were given the number of successes we have. We were given our x. What if we're not? Like here, a study of sleepwalking was described in Neurology Magazine, and it included information that 29.2% of the 19,136 American adults who are studied have sleepwalked. What's the actual number of adults who have sleepwalked? Well, you may be like, this is really easy, and yes, it is. We simply need to find what 29.2% of 19,136 is. Or very simply, we convert from a percent to a decimal, giving us 0 0.292. Multiply it by our sample size, and we get our answer. Now, can you have 0.712 of a person who has sleepwalked? The answer is no. So we always round this to the nearest whole number. So in this case, since it goes 0 0.7, we're gonna go up one to 5,588. And that's it. Well, not for testing the proportion, but for finding our x value. <laughs> so now let's test the proportion. Using a 0 0.05 significance level again, we wanna test the claim that for the adult population, the proportion of those who have sleepwalked, sleepwalked is less than 30. Or 0.3, sorry. So we have to check our requirements. Since we are assuming that at least 30 have, or uh, yeah, at, at least 30% have sleepwalked, sleepwalked, that becomes our P, 0.3. So we get 19,136 times 0.3, give us 5,740.8, clearly greater than or equal to five. And then we do n times q. So if 0.3 is our p, our q must be 0.7, and we end up with 13,395.2, again, greater than or equal to 0.5, our conditions are met, we're good to go. So what is the claim? The claim is that the proportion is less than 0.3, so P less than 0.3. The opposite of that is P is greater than or equal to 0.3. So since our claim is that P is less than 0.3, that becomes our alternative hypothesis, or our claim, and our null hypothesis becomes P is equal to 0.3. So from there, we can go through and figure the rest out. Now, since the level of significance as alpha is given to us, we don't really have to do anything for step four. And step five and six here, you can see there that is the screen that we would type into our calculator to get these values. I went ahead and did that for us and got us our answer. Okay, if you want to check it, go through, type those values into your calculator and see what you get. Okay. Notice here though, this last row, on that first problem, I had this option selected. On this problem, I have this option selected. And the reason why is very simple. Our null hypothesis is or our alternative hypothesis is different. Our first alternative hypothesis is that the majority of consumers were uncomfortable with drone deliveries. So we need it to be greater than our initial, our null hypothesis. Here, our claim is that it's less than 
30%. So we need it to be less than our null hypothesis. And so we choose this middle option. Okay. If our claim was simply that it is not 30%, we don't know is it more or less, then we would choose the proportion not equal to P0. Now, once you've typed this in your calculator, you hit enter. Remember, we are doing the one prop Z test because we are dealing with a proportion. Prop, proportion, makes sense. We get this result. And again, the big thing we need to pull out here is our P value is P equals 0 0.00796763513 or 0 0.008. Okay. That value is definitely, again, less than 0 0.01. So we are going to say that there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that fewer than 30% of adults have sleep blocked. And that's it. That's all it is. That's all there is to testing this hypothesis. It's really that easy. Use your calculator and everything works out. Now let's talk about means. There's a little wrinkle with means. And it's not a new wrinkle, it's actually the same wrinkle as we dealt with last section using estimates. We had a T distribution that was introduced to us last time, and then we also had the lovely Z distribution that we've been using. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. The same conditions are going to apply. Are we talking about some, are we making a claim about a mean where we know something about the population standard deviation, or do we not know anything? And that's going to dictate what test we do. So, very simple. Okay, use the formal test, which is what we've been doing. Okay, here's our symbols that we're going to use. N is our sample size. X is the sample mean. Uh, sorry, X bar is our sample mean. S is our sample standard deviation, and mu sub x bar is the population mean. Now, you may be like, I thought population mean was mu. Well, it is, but if you remember, mu sub x bar is the mean of the sample mean distribution, right? Remember this from central limit theorem, and those two things are equal, they're the same, okay? So, <clears throat> our conditions here are similar to the central limit theorem in that we have to have a simple random sample, and then either the population is normally distributed or n has to be greater than 30. So with those requirements in mind, we can quickly assess whether or not we can or cannot conduct a hypothesis test about a population mean. So here is this example. The number of hours slept that U.S. adults in the, the number of hours of sleep that U.S. adults get it's approximately normally distributed. A sample of 12 randomly selected adults was collected, and those times and hours are listed below. A common co recommendation is that adults should sleep between seven and nine hours each night. Using the p-value method with a 0 0.05 significance level to test the claim that the mean amount of sleep for adults is less than seven hours. So what we're saying here is that it's recommended you get at least seven hours, if not more, and we are testing the claim that people get less. So that feeds into our steps one and two after we check our requirements. So we were told that a sample of 12 randomly selected adults, right, 12 randomly selected adults, so they were randomly selected, so it's a simple random sample. Now the next thing, n isn't greater than 30, because n is 12. However, we are told that the population is normally distributed, and therefore, we are good to go. So, the claim, the average amount of sleep that an adult gets is less than seven hours. The alternative to that is that it's greater than, whew, sorry, greater than or equal to seven hours. So from those two ideas, we can easily get our null and alternative hypothesis. Our null hypothesis is simply that the mean is equal to seven hours. Alternative hypothesis, the mean is less than seven hours. So let's test that. Again, our alpha is given for us, so let's look at our options here for five and six. Now, you already see it here, but notice all we were given was this string of data. Okay, We are not given a population standard deviation. 
we're not given a standard deviation of the population, we're not given sigma, we have to use t, just like we did with confidence intervals. We, we, when we didn't know sigma, we used our t distribution. Now, to do that, it's very simple. You go to the exact same place you went to do the one prop z test, but instead of scrolling all the way down to one prop z test, you just choose option number two, t test. Now, for a t test and z test, there's two different things we can do. Okay. And it's right here at the top, input, data, or stats. You see if I use the left arrow, it highlights data. And if I hit enter on that, it'll lock that in and it changed my options. If I do stats and enter on that, it changed my options again. What this is doing is it's using a, a very easy process of saying, okay, you are doing a t-test. You're doing a hypothesis test where you don't know the population's mean, standard deviation. Do you have stats, or in other words, means and sample standard deviations, or do you have a list of data? Okay, we're gonna do it both ways. And so the first thing we have to do is go to stat, stat, edit, and we need to enter in our data here, our 4844. So we have 48. Four, four. Be quicker for you guys because you aren't jumping from screen to screen. Uh, eight, six, nine. Six, nine, seven, seven, ten, seven, eight, seven, eight. And remember, if you highlight the very last entry in that list, it'll tell you the number it is or how many entries you've got. It's twelve. Just how many samples we had, so we're good. So there's two things you can do here. One thing with you, what you can do is you can go to stat, calculate the one variable statistics, right, which gives us our mean and sample standard deviation. And so we can say, cool, so our mean is 6.83 repeating forever. Our standard deviation is 1.992409844. So we round those numbers off and we are off to the races. And so if we round those numbers off, we get this left-hand side here, okay? So our null hypothesis was that the mean is seven. Um, so I don't have anything to say, you know, to do the simple X bar on here for some reason. So I'm saying X bar, our sample standard, our sample mean, is 6.8 because it was 6.833333 so we just say 6.8 standard deviation is 2 because our sample standard deviation was 1.999 something so it's just 2 and it is 12. now our claim here is that the number of hours of sleep that adults get is less than 7 so we want to choose this middle option here that the mu is that mu is less than mu 0 or null hypothesis now this way is great, it's gonna get you answers, but we can go more exact. And instead of choosing stats, we can choose data. And if we do that, it's really, really easy. We've already entered our data into the list. So we go down and choose t-test. And now we wanna go over to data and hit enter. Since we already have our data in L1, we're good. And so what we end up with, the only thing we have to do is tell it what we want our null hypothesis to be, in this case, 7. The list and frequency leave completely alone, never change those. And then our alternative hypothesis is that the mean was less than the null hypothesis. And then we get calculate. Again, always calculate, never draw. And we get this screen here. Now, this screen is slightly different than if you did stats and entered that information. 
and let's see what we get on those. So rather than kind of having them on the screen and kind of bounce back and forth, I have them here side by side. So this right here is what you would get if you did this, if you went stats and entered the rounded off values into your statistics. If you use the data and told it to collect that data that you've already entered, this is the information you get. This is always gonna be more accurate, so make sure you're very careful, okay? So, what does this tell me? Well, it tells me I did a t-test, and you said that the null hypothesis is that the mean was seven, and your alternative hypothesis is that the mean is less than seven. So here's our critical t value is negative 0.289774853 our p value again it's just shortening that up our p value is 0.388688459 and our x bar our sample mean was 6.83 repeating forever and our standard deviation was 1.9924 which is what we already saw again only thing we need to pull from all of this information is the p value so in this case here that is this 0.3886888 over here, it's 0.36778. Notice, those are a little different. Now, if they were right on the cusp of whether of our alpha level, we might want to do another survey, or we might want to do a larger survey to get better numbers, or to do the exact values, which is what the list does, not rounded off values, which is what we did over here. So we get a very accurate idea whether we want to reject or fail to reject. So, because our alpha is, or sorry, our p-value is 0.3887, which is larger than 0 0.05, we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And so what that means is we can say that there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean amount of adult sleep is less than seven hours. Okay? Pretty easy, right? We just figured out that we did not know the population standard deviation, we then, using either the list and the data format for the t-test, or by using the list in one of our stats to give us our stat points, we then use the t-test, okay? So, let's do it again. This time, I want you guys to try. Start right now, pause this video, and see, can you do this entire hypothesis test without looking at any further slides. All right, welcome back, good job. For those of you that did it, congratulations. For those of you that said, I'm not gonna do it, I'm just gonna wait until he starts talking again. Well, you should have. You still can, pause the video. All right, let's start. First step. Check the requirements. We have to make sure those work, right? Because if we can't do it, we can't do the steps of doing it, right? So, <sighs> simple study. Our sample size is 106. That is definitely greater than 30. We're good to go. So, our claim here is that the population mean is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is kind of like, wait, I thought our claim was something different than the accepted norm. But this time it isn't but it also is and so it kind of this very kind of wordy weird thing but what we claimed was the population mean is 98.6 our alternative to this is that it's not so we use mu is not equal to 98.6 now again remember the null hypothesis is always the equals statement so since the first step our claim was the equal statement that actually becomes a null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis is that mu does not equal 98.6. Now you may be asking, why am I using does not equal when the sample mean was less than? Why wouldn't I use that mu is less than 98.6? And it simply comes down to wording. Because we said our claim was that the mean is 98.6, the opposite of that is that it is not. Now, does that mean you can't test that it's less than and be more specific in your results? Absolutely not. You can absolutely test that and that would be fine. But because of the wording here, we're going to stick with this option. Again, we're using 0 0.05. Again, we don't know sigma, so we are using the t-test again. 
This time, though, we don't have any data. Well, I mean, there's 106 data points, but we don't have them personally. And I don't want to enter 106 points in my calculator. But what I know is I know that x bar is 98.2. And I know that s sub x, so our sample mean and our sample standard deviation, our sample standard deviation is 0.62. Our null hypothesis is that our, the body temperature is 98.6. And we are testing that the mean is actually not equal to null hypothesis. So this is what we put. And then let's see what we get. Now, a lot of you guys on that last discussion problem last week were using, we're just saying that, oh yeah, no, the temperature is 98.6, 98.2 is barely any different, right? But remember, we're talking about statistically significance here. So, if you look at this, the one thing you need to pull is that p-value. Right, p-value, is our p-value 1.4? I'm asking, is our p-value 1.4? Right? The p-value, right? If we go, if we were to go way back in our slides, the very beginning, the basics of hypothesis testing, that p-value is the probability that we are an extreme value, right? So it's the probability that we are, you know, kind of that value or greater or that value or less, kind of similarly. But this is 1.4. Probabilities are only between zero and one. What's happening? How is this possible? Oh, oh. If I just look at the whole number, not just the first two digits, it's obvious. E negative nine, ah, oh, that does it. That means, remember, E negative nine is scientific notation in our calculator. So this means I need to move this decimal place nine places to the left. So what I get is 0, 0.0, and I have eight of those zeros now. So I have 0, 0.0000000000. 1. That's my p-value. That's extremely small. So it says here, our p-value of 0, which is really kind of a 0 plus situation, if you remember what that means. 0 plus means that, yeah, it rounds to 0 because it's so small, but it's not exactly 0. That's definitely less than our significance level of 0.05. So that tells me there is sufficient evidence to warrant rejecting the common belief of the population mean is 98.6. So this is kind of a little kind of conjoined kind of statement of, of step seven and our kind of final conclusion. So since this was so low, we would reject the null hypothesis and a, and a kind of formulaic way of stating that conclusion, what we would say is there is sufficient evidence to suggest that the population mean of body temperature is not 98.6, okay? So there's other ways you can say that. That way works right here. It works very nice. Rejection is not some complicated statistical term. Null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, things like that would be. So you wanna avoid those. So we don't wanna say like reject the null hypothesis. We would just say you can reject the common belief that the population mean is 98.6. All right, we're getting there, we're almost done. What if you know what sigma is? So we just did pop proportions, which sigma is not a piece of that. Then we did sample means, or we did mean, and we didn't know what sigma is. We had no idea what sigma is. And so we used the t-test for that. But if we know what sigma is, then just like with a confidence interval, with a confidence interval, if we knew what sigma was, we were finding z sub alpha over 2. If we didn't know what sigma was, we used t sub alpha over 2. So if we do know what sigma is, we are going to use a, t, a Z test instead of the T test. Now again, super easy way to get to it, and it's just the exact same way we got to the T test. Stat over to test, and instead of T, the very first option is Z test. It's that easy. Okay. That is it. Now let me show you what is on the Z test. Okay, it's basically the exact same things. So the Z test. Let's go stats. That's most likely what I'm going to give you. Now it says what is the null hypothesis? That's our first option. And then it says what is sigma? Sigma is known for our, for the world. So what is that? 
And then it says, okay, what's your sample mean? What's your sample size? What's your alternative hypothesis? The t-test, if you know, so kind of take a little mental screenshot or pause and write this down. The t-test asks for the exact same information. The only difference is that the x bar and sx, the standard deviation, are flipped. In a t-test, it asks for the sample mean and then the sample standard deviation. In a z-test, it asks for the population standard deviation and then the sample mean. But it's the same information, same thing. As long as you're reading your symbols correctly, it's so easy to fill out and you get the same information. So let's tell this to calculate this stuff, which, what was that? Let's do um, point, a, no, 1.8. I'm just making things up. These are the numbers from our sleep problem, but don't worry about it. Calculate, we get our p-value 0.374, right? So our resulting screen is the same as well. So hypothesis testing is really simple. What you have to do, what you have to write down, you have to write down what your null and alternative hypotheses are. You have to write down what your alpha is, unless it's given to you in the problem. If you're gonna use your own alpha, you need to write that down very clearly. Uh, you need to write down what test you did. And if you're doing this on paper, you it's always a good idea to show me exactly what you put into that test. So what you typed into your calculator exactly. And so I say that because then on your test coming up here, uh, you can use that in the show your work portion. Um, and then what the p-value is, whether you're rejecting or failing to reject, and your final conclusion statement. So, null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, what test you used and the information you put into it, the p-value, your final decision about whether you are rejecting or failing to reject, and a good old English sentence with the final result, conclusion. That's it, that's all there is. This is the last lesson. It has been a pleasure to virtually teach you guys and to have never seen very many of you. Those of you who I did see, it was awesome. Those of you who I didn't see, that was still pretty awesome. So I will see you guys around. If you have any questions, as always, shoot me an email.